I teach at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. This is uh, about 20,000 students. We're on the Central Coast, about halfway between LA and San Francisco. Um, I've been, this will be my 20th year. The ground is shifting in many ways. It's shifting in technology. It's shifting in the demographics of students. It's shifting in the models of education, right, that we're seeing coming down the pipe. So in many ways, it's a really bracing, exciting time, but it's an exhausting time. If you're like me, you're, you're trying new things out and you're excited by the possibilities of the new this or that new technology and um, find that half the time it doesn't work in the classroom that you are assigned to or half the time the students don't understand it because they're not nearly as tech savvy as we like to think they are. It's like that sort of exciting but bracing uh, feeling. At least from my perspective, that's kind of how things have changed in the last decade or so. So that said, because I tend to be a kind of an, an optimist and I'm always trying these new things, I'd like to try to pass along a little of um, some of the things I think that, uh, that are worth keeping and save you maybe some of the trouble of trying them out on your own. Uh, you know, where, where does personal motivation come from? So let's spend just a second thinking about intrinsic versus extrinsic. Probably both need to be there. There's some good work the, out on um, which is a more powerful motivator for classroom settings. Uh, of course, we all play in this space. We all do this thing where we have to require grades, right? So that's one of the limits, if you want to put it that way, of, of the model that we're working in. Um, grades, especially higher, um, higher weighted grades, sometimes have a negative impact on uh, student learning and outcomes and tests. So what about uh, intrinsic motivation? Let's think about that for just a minute. Uh, Dan Pink, thinking about um, intrinsic motivation, where does it come from and are we messing with it? Is there a way we can create linkages to autonomy, mastery, purpose? Well. I'm not going to lie and say that I think that we can all uh, sort of let the students have complete autonomy, um, especially if we haven't clearly defined our goals. However, there is some autonomy um, that can be uh, created. So, so I'm going to introduce here some educational tech um, tools that I think do sort of open the door a little bit to autonomy. You may have seen these adapt adaptive learning quizzes. This comes from the Krugman Wells uh, Launchpad. There are instructors, and you may be um, this type of instructor that has multiple paths to a, a grade. You may have choose project A, B, or C. Um, I have a colleague in materials engineering that, that offers a C to everybody that passes with an 80% or better on the exams that they can take as many times as they want. Um, and they can, they can leave with a C if they've understood the core concepts. But if they want a B or an A, they have to do another project on top of it, right? And so they self-select. The more interested, motivated students self-select to spend more time with the teacher. Um, so there's, there's clearly a lot of ways we can play with autonomy. Um, I would say let's think more about that. Mastery, clearly, learning curve and adaptive learning quizzes um, and, and, and a lot of assessment, frankly, are about mastery, right? So assessment clearly is a um, key component. Mastery. Uh, one of the beautiful things about learning curve or in, an adaptive quiz like this is that usually it's low stakes and there's no penalty for getting the thing wrong. So I don't know if your students are like this, but at Cal Poly we um, increasingly are seeing a lot of student stress and anxiety issues. Um, so there's a nice sort of no-fail method for them to show up to class. These are given as pre-learning pre uh, quizzes, pre-lecture quizzes to get them sort of some sort of experience, um, at least with the terminology, which can sometimes, I think, uh, if, if you might agree with me, that the terminology in economics can be a blockade, right? <clears throat> and we end up spending too much time in class asking or answering the question, uh, to, you know, what, what's another example of opportunity cost? Or <clears throat> what does um, absolute advantage versus comparative advantage mean? If they were to show up to class with some of that under their belt already, we get to some of the more fun stuff. So that's been my experience with Learning Curve after trying most of the learning platforms out there. And students have reported to me at the end of the quarter when I give feedback quizzes, um, they report that Learning Curve was the single most, or any adaptive quiz, I guess, would be, for them, Learning Curve was the single most important um, 
tool for their learning economics. And probably that's because there was a natural incentive uh, for them to spend time on task and learn the stuff. So you'll notice um, I'm talking about every lecture beforehand they're doing these quizzes. So they're doing a lot of these quizzes. They're at low stakes. They're a pass-fail. So they, they keep getting fed questions according to how they're doing until they reach a certain level. And then, they, then they've got the full credit on the thing. Um, so it does, I'm finding and, and hearing from them that it does reduce stress. The class that I'm teaching right now has got 200, well, one of the classes has 230, and it's a hybrid, so it's half um, online and half in class. So I'm doing a lot of experimenting with games, but I'm finding it essential for the distance learning part to have something that keeps them accountable. And this, for me, is a really nice, um, natural way, low stakes, low stress way for them to stay accountable. Another sort of note about assessment. So this article is basically finding, this was in the STEM classroom, but probably there's some crossover with econ. Um, and we've got uh, three times. Three times is the rule. So let them be assessed on supply and demand. Let them be assessed on comparative advantage, not just once and then at the end in the final exam, but three times. So this takes a little bit of babysitting your homeworks, right? bringing forward old questions. Um, but if they see it three times and we're required to view their answers, right, amongst a whole laundry list of interventions, these three stood out. Uh, performance improved by a, kind of a shocking amount. So there's some interventions to take home with you. So let's think about um, distance learning or, or any type of learning really, but how do you find some purpose? Discussion boards, if you're teaching distance or you're teaching a large class, you're probably at some point going to be using discussion boards. Um, especially, f so for my course, this, pardon me, this time, it's not all non-majors, non-business, non-econ majors. And so uh, there's, as you can expect, you know, some of you are teaching in the same space, kind of um, some really beautiful things about that and some really hard things about that. Very different levels of um, ability with respect to um, analytics, understanding graphs, understanding basic um, abstract theory. But at the same time, they bring um, fresh questions. They bring to these discussion boards some really cool points of view. And there's evidence now that depending on the level of Bloom's taxonomy that you're aiming for, and you should aim for the appropriate level, and you should aim higher maybe than we've been aiming. Um, so make sure your language in your discussion board is um, appropriate, right? So that you use the verbs that you at the level that you want them to be um, thinking, the level of critical thinking. So you can have this sort of um, structured, really, really sort of structured, limited, maybe you defined roles for your discussion board, um, some sort of constraints, or you can leave it wide open. You want to think about your goals. Is it that you just want people to feel safe about you know, expressing themselves? Then you would have a very different discussion board than if you wanted them to sort of analyze two articles and um, you know, sort of synthesize ideas and, and critique, et cetera. Um, and it depends on the size of the class as well. So there's lots of different things you can do with discussion boards, but and here's why I'm making the case for it being some sort of purpose, intrinsic motivation. The community, especially in a large class or a distance learning class of discussion boards, is really beneficial, right? Really beneficial. Think about your people that are sitting in a class of 1,000, don't know anybody else. Think about your introverts. Uh, think about the people that don't necessarily find any community in school. And we know now, as we're looking at what creates um, high failure rates uh, for the CSU project, that the level of engagement with peers is crucial, right? Especially for first generation students, of which we're finding more and more. Um, very difficult for them to, to, to stick it out, do the perseverance, do the, the hard work of, of, um, of learning over the course of your term if they don't have some sort of community to be accountable to, to commiserate with, whatever. So it is some sort of a community. And in that, there's purpose, there's 
there's um, some level of engagement that isn't there without. So think about discussion boards if you haven't already done that. There's, it's, there's some nice easy ways, depending on your LMS, to sort of grade um, without spending too much time. Yeah. So depending on what sort of LMS you have, you can play with giving full credit upon completion. You can play with you know, giving people, um, they're not allowed to see others um, post until they've posted themselves, et cetera. Yeah. So you can really play with different ways to do these, dis to do these discussion boards. Pardon me. Um, one way that I've been using the discussion board, obviously California, we're having some water issues. We're thinking about water pricing in California. Should the state subsidize you know, agricultural water? Uh, what's the impact of that? This is Lake Mead after seven years of drought. And I'm finding uh, that animates some people. Some people just need some sort of reason to care and, and bringing it back to the non-abstract does it. Um, now that I've sort of talked about in the, in the positive what's going on with motivation um, and how we can use motivation um, that already exists, let me talk about some of the weaknesses in our motivation and think about um, how that can, uh, how we can use those. So this is, I think this is Aikido and I'm trying, I'm, I'm visualizing that she's using his momentum against him, right? So here's what I mean. If our students are so competitive, right, if that is a known behavioral um, economic state, that we're competitive, we're competitor oriented, why not use that? Why not show them in our, in our eye clickers how women vote compared to men? Why not show them how different majors vote? Um, why not, this is just an example of how you can use clickers for opinion questions, but also for your own feedback. Um, and there's some really fun games out there. Caution, give yourself some time. If you, if you get started playing these games to see if they're going to work, give yourself some time because you absolutely will get addicted. I think there's something there, right? I think you want to sort of um, use visuals. We know visuals, as Jose has been talking about. Um, uh, multimedia is definitely much more effective than not doing it. But I'm going to end with thinking about the planning fallacy, thinking about how hard it is for, for students to know how much time they need to put into studying, right? How can we overcome that? Again, just do, just quiz them, do the assessment early and often. All this stuff, though, honestly, is, uh, means nothing to the students unless you also protect your motivation. And it's the motivation and the engagement of the teachers. So. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. You've self-selected to come here. These are highly motivated teachers. However, after teaching for 20 years, I got to tell you, and you know this, you got to protect your motivation and make sure that your engagement and your thrill of teaching is there after 20 years, or 30, or 40, or 50.